Welcome to Courtside, everyone, a discussion of Donald Trump and the absurd legal mess he has created. It is day 74. Trump is still impeached for the second time, and his legal troubles and those of his pals continue to mount. It turns out that Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, and retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn all participated in efforts to promote the January 6th Stop the Steal event at the Capitol, an event which we all know left many dead and causing Donald Trump to be the first president in United States history to be impeached for a second time. Now, two of these guys, Flynn and Stone, have already been pardoned by the president for past crimes. Now they're looking at new ones. So after the election, Roger Stone encouraged protesters to come to D.C. He was billed as a featured speaker for the January 6th rally, but he didn't actually show. I know, shock of shock, Roger Stone didn't keep his word. Now, Michael Flynn spoke at a December 12th rally in Washington, D.C. that promoted Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the election. Indeed, he told the crowd that, uh, that they had reached a, quote, crucible moment and there has to be sacrifice. He continued, we're in a battle for the heart and soul of this country. We will win. And press reports also show that Steve Bannon played a significant role in promoting the January 6th rally. Indeed, shortly after losing the 2020 election, Bannon's War Room podcast was banned from Twitter because it suggested that Dr. Fauci and FBI Director Chris Wray should be beheaded. Here's what he said, quote, I'd put their heads on pikes. Right. I put them at the two corners of the White House building as a warning to federal bureaucrats you either get with the program or you or you are gone. And Bannon's been speaking repeatedly to Trump since he lost the November election, conspiring with ways to steal it back. What a motley cast of characters. Now, the other big news is, of course, impeachment. And I've promised you a deep dive on this question of whether or not you can try a president after he's left office. The answer is yes. So the next few weeks are going to be very tough for Republicans in the Senate. In the mornings, they're going to be fighting to defend the last president from a conviction. And in the afternoons, they're going to struggle to stop the new president from actually getting anything done. And part of their strategy is to say, like Tom Cotton and others, that you can't try an ex-president. Well, let's begin, as we should in all constitutional questions, with the text of the Constitution. Article 2, Section 4 says, quote, The president, vice president, and all civil officers shall be removed from office on impeachment for conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And we've talked about that lots on past court sides. That's what gives you the substantive standard for what is impeachable. But truly, it doesn't say anything one way or the other about whether a former official can be impeached. But that's not the only clause in the Constitution. There's Article 1, Section 3. And that says, quote, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Trump's ears perk up. Profit under the United States? Um, Anyway, the Constitution here does expressly contemplate a lifetime ban on office holding as an option for punishment. It requires a second majority vote of the Senate, to be sure, but it does expressly say that. And the idea here is a different one than removing someone from office. Removal neutralizes a clear present danger, someone who's in there now. But a lifetime ban is about saying, look, you, never again, which is, of course, perfectly made for Donald Trump. Now, once you think about impeachment as having that second punishment of a lifetime ban, There's no logical reason whatsoever why a never again punishment should only apply to sitting officials. Otherwise, anyone could just avoid impeachment by resigning. And lo and behold, exactly that happened in 1876. We had a horrible Secretary of War, which is the head of the what was you know the Pentagon War Department, Defense Department. It's called the War Department back then. His name was William Belknap. And he resigned literally minutes before the House voted to impeach him. The House said, "Um, we're impeaching you anyway. And the Senate concluded that they had the power to try him, even though he had resigned from office. 
Indeed, they adopted a resolution that said that Belknap could be tried, quote, for acts done as Secretary of War, notwithstanding his resignation of said office. And law professor Brian Colt, who I've mentioned on past episodes, wrote a lengthy law review article about this, and he pointed out in England, impeachment of former officials had happened at the time of the founding, as it had in many states. Indeed, in many states, it was expressly in the Constitution. If the founders wanted to preclude that common practice, one would think they would have said so in the text of the Constitution. That's particularly so because the one impeachment case that we know was mentioned in the Philadelphia Convention was that of Warren Hastings. Warren Hastings was the former governor of Bengal um, who resigned, and the British still impeached him anyway. George Mason brought the case up at the floor of the Philadelphia Convention. And indeed, in America, our very first impeachment proceeding was against former Senator William Blount. Blount had worked with the British to try and give them some territory. And he was acquitted ultimately, but not because you couldn't impeach a former senator, but because you couldn't impeach a senator altogether as the, as the Congress decided. And there's other precedents too. In 1926, there was a judge, Judge English, who resigned after being impeached. And the Senate threw out the case and said, there's no point in proceeding here. But the House managers expressly said in that Senate proceeding, the resignation, quote, in no way affected the right of the Senate sitting as a court of impeachment to hear and determine the case. And other cases have had similar language, including a judge in 2009, Samuel Kent, who resigned and the manager said something similar. Now, there are two final problems here for Donald Trump, and they are significant. First, even if you think, like Cotton, Senator Cotton evidently does, that the Congress doesn't have a freestanding power to try former officials, here the process began while Trump was president. It wasn't just he was former, you know, like trying to impeach Obama or George W. Bush or something now in 2021. Trump was president when he was impeached. And you might have asked yourself over the last week, why was the House so concerned about moving this proceeding so fast? Because they wanted to put it on the firmest legal ground possible. And this is extremely strong legal ground. It would be nuts to have a rule that said that you have to impeach and convict someone while they're in office and have the whole thing soup to nuts done all in time because that would make someone effectively immune from impeachment in the last month of their presidency, even though that last month that president has all sorts of awesome powers, including holding the nuclear codes, which has kept me up at night for many nights um, with this particular president. So that's problem number one. Even if you buy the cotton view, it doesn't apply here because we're dealing with someone who was impeached while he was president. Second, Practically, this, these arguments aren't getting Trump anywhere. And the reason for that is he can't bring them to court. There is no judicial review, basically, of impeachment. It's a political process, and the Supreme Court thinks of it largely as a political question. So what the Senate does on this question of can you impeach a former official is what controls. And so if a majority concludes that a former president can be tried, he can be tried. The Senate's going to have the last word, not the federal courts or his justices or the like, as Donald Trump keeps thinking. And all of this is very significant because there are reports now that White House officials are turning on Trump. Imagine if you're Donald Trump, you've done your job so poorly that your coworkers have gone out of their way to get you fired again, even after you've already boxed up your desk. And that's part of why I've said a delayed trial which Trump's, you know, bad lawyers have tried to get here is actually bad for him. As a lawyer, I think I would ask, do I want to have a fast trial or a slow one for my client? And as we've talked about in a past episode, I think a longer time period for the trial is very bad for Trump for three reasons. First, because more evidence is likely to be found against him about what he did on January 6th and before that, text messages, witnesses, and so on. Second, he's going to be out of power in three and a half days. And every day after January 20th is a day when he's not president. He's a weak, 
powerless, um, I dare say impotent um, man at that point. And, uh, and so when the powers of the presidency come off of him, he's not going to be able to threaten people quite the same way. And third, of course, more time is more time for Donald Trump to say crazy, seditious things, which we all know he's going to do, and all of that will be used against him later on. So this time allows the Democrats, um, who are already unified, to make their case in even stronger ways, and the Republicans, who are on the fence, to probably come in this direction. So a faster resolution for Trump, I suspect, would have been better. And I know Republicans are right now all claiming that they're livid about the impeachment process and so on. But if the fundraising efforts that they launched around Stop the Steal is any indication, I'm sure they'll be selling commemorative T-shirts by the end of this week. So as we look to the last three days of Donald Trump's presidency, note he is leaving office with a 29% approval rating and with a boatload of of legal liabilities. But it's not all bad for Trump. His various trials are about to get him some great ratings. So that's Courtside for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow if there is more legal news tomorrow. Otherwise, I'll see you on Monday. Thanks so much.